Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk. Now, this podcast is all about tax lien certificates and how to make predictable, certain, and secure money. It's also about tax deeds, which are really tax defaulted properties. Now, in both cases, with tax liens and tax deeds, there'll be thousands of them available. Not to worry. This is a business that's filled with abundance, serious surpluses. Now, my intention on the podcast is to help you gain new information that will help you become wealthy. And we want to do that as much as possible without you having any risk. Now, later in the podcast, I'll have a special guest. I call them all special because they really are. And the guest's name is Seth Green. Now, you're going to be shocked when you listen to his part of the podcast because Seth really helped me out. He'll help you out too. But I want you to uh, listen as I interview him and talk with him because uh, I had a property that I wanted to sell and actually do a rent to own. And uh, I couldn't find a broker and I was struggling because they weren't quality people that helped me out. And Seth gave me a few ideas about how to sell a property. And so for less than $1,000, I sold the property. I actually did a rent to own, which I'm going to get more money than I would have sold it. He's going to tell us how he did it. I just copycatted him, but I want you to hear that. So that'll be on the tail end of all this. So that's during the second half. And I'll also have shortly after I finish, I'll have one of my coaches come on and that's Bob Schumacher. And you're just going to love to listen to this guy. He's uh, been with me over 15 years. So I like to include these experts so that you gain insight, not just from me about how to make money, but you want to get other people that have a lot of good ideas and see if you can take their successful ideas, then add them to your ideas. And then that combination will probably create a breakthrough for you. So think about combinations of people helping you out and they've got lots of ideas and and you've got lots of ideas. But if you can blend those together, that's going to make a a big difference in your life. So that's why I have these guests come on. At any point right now, you're probably listening to this because you want to make more money and you want to change your future. And I certainly understand that. Maybe you're saying to yourself, how is my job? How is my career going? Is my income growing fast enough? Or are my expenses growing too fast? Which most people, their expenses are growing too fast and their income isn't. So that's why you're here and that's why I'm here to help you, okay? I want you to get in on things where you're not going to be buying a lot of things on credit cards and running up a lot of debts. Let's get in on things that are going to increase your income and do that without risk as much as possible. So I don't know where you are in your life, but I can assure you learning this business will be in your best interest. Now, you're probably thinking it would be nice to discover a program where you could make money and make it quickly. That's what this is all about. So I'm going to teach you and throughout the uh, podcast how to accelerate your income and get yourself moving. Now, from my experience of watching people and observing who really makes money and who really is successful and has security in their life, it's really important to watch what people do. Now, I try to learn from other people because they have other strategies that I never would have dreamed about. And if I can copycat their strategies just by listening and talking to them, that's going to help me. Now, as I do that, I'm going to pass all that on to you or as much as I can. But if you're going to make decisions by not just doing it yourself, but watching how other people do it and then analyze why did they do it before you make that quick decision yourself. So my intention on the podcast is always to make a difference in your life. So I do that by watching other successful people, and I'm a practitioner. Whatever I, t- whatever I talk about, I'm doing it. So you want to make money quickly? We're going to do that in this business. Okay, now everyone comes to me with a question that I'm going to delve into right now. Now, I believe everyone needs a guide. Now, I say that meaning you need someone to hold your hand, someone to help you a little bit. The big question that I get from people is, should I get a coach? Should I have a mentor? Should I get someone to help me? Of course you should. Well, I'm not the world's expert on being able to tell you what coaches to get. Now, I have four coaches that work for me. However, I get coaching personally from about six to eight other people who I respect and admire who have been successful in business. My coaches teach strictly tax lien certificates and tax deeds. But what I get, I'm happy to pass on to you either way. So people come to me and ask me the question, who should I get for a coach? So let me say this before I give you some guidance. 
if you get this wrong, it's going to cost you a lot of money and you're going to waste a lot of time. So let me tell you how I choose an expert to help me out. Okay. Now, the standards I give you, I've just developed from experience. I didn't go to a special school to learn. I just learned that there's a difference between a good coach and a great coach and a great mentor. Okay, great coaches and mentors is what you want to shoot for. What I mean by that is who teaches you the real stuff? I don't want a whole bunch of gobbledygook and BS. What I really want to do, forget about the hype. Just show me how to make money. And so my coaches are instructed, show you how to make money. You can get all bogged down with everything but that. And if you do that, you're going to be a long time before you make any money. Okay? So let me give you this in two steps. This is going to be relatively simple, not going to be hard to do. Okay? If you get this right, your income is going to change. And it's going to change quickly because you're going to get recommendations that are going to talk about making money. Okay? So I'm going to give you some example of people went from zero to $100,000 a year. I don't know if I'll get it on this podcast, but I'll give you lots of examples before we get done so you can stay tuned to those future things. Okay, so lesson number one. What you want to know is what what is this good coach going to teach you? Whatever it is, if it's tax liens and deeds, is the person that you're considering, you want to consider them as a good coach or a mentor, are they already getting amazing results. Now, what's amazing results? I'm talking about money in the bank. Are they doing it and getting money in the bank? If you're trying to make more income, it doesn't make sense to work with someone that isn't getting amazing results. So you have to find out if that coach hasn't made amazing money, then what are you working with them for? They're just going to use up your time and your money. Okay. Now, there's lots of nice people out there. And I've made this mistake a million times. I said a million times. There's lots of people out there that are offering to help you. I get it. They're offering to help you. They're really nice people. You admire them. That's all yuck. All you really care about is results. So I evaluate people, whether it's in my office or whether it's a coach or a mentor, on results. So that's a seven-letter word. Why don't you write that down? Seven-letter word, results. Let's face it. Ted's not one of those kissy fakes guys. I just want to tell me about the results. Okay. So making money is tough. Believe me, it never gets easy. I don't have a magic wand. Nobody gave me the money to get started. I have to make money. So evaluate that coach on basically, can they make you money? If they can't make you money, they can't prove they made money. Forget about them. All right. I said, I'd do two parts. So let me do the second part. You should ask yourself, is the question, is the coach that you're going to employ getting amazing results. I mean, in the bank results for their students, not just for themselves, are they getting it for their students? Now, see, some people can go out and make money for themselves, piece of cake, but they can't tell you what they did because they're just winging it and hoping it's always going to work. You want a coach that's making money for their students. So if the stu coach can't tell you about two or three or five or 25 deals, then you don't want that coach. You want someone that's making money for themselves and making money for them students, all right? So there's just two things. Now, that's pretty easy. If you don't want to get someone that's teaching you how to make $5,000, give me a break, $5,000. You want someone that's going to teach you how to make a whopping $25,000 or $50,000 on one deal. So at the end of the day, this guy's working, or gal, is working towards making 100000 Now, look, it doesn't take a genius to figure out if you're taking training from some guy that's talking about making $5,000, it's going to take you decades before you'll have enough to break, brag about. You need to get into this where you're going to make twenty-five dollars and $50,000 a deal. Keep in mind, if the coach isn't earning a living and talking about tax liens and deeds, or they've been doing something else for a living, then that's probably not the guy that you want or the gal that you want, okay? Now, just think about how confident and how competent you would feel if you made $50,000 on one deal. Now, just ask yourself that question right now. How would you feel if you made $50,000? So why not tell your coach, look, I want to make twenty-five dollars and $50,000. Can you help me do that? As I said earlier, if you get this wrong, the whole process is going to be an uphill battle, and it takes months and years to fix people when they don't have any money 
or they've used up their bank account, or they're using up their pension plan. Okay, so some investors have a little bit of capital, then you've got to be very cautious on how you're using that capital. If you use it on anything, use it on a good coach, and then borrow the money to do the deals. But the point is, you've got to get a coach that's, number one, making money for themselves. Number two, they're making money for their students. So that kind of gives you my rundown on what I think. Now, a good coach is going to give you some kind of a roadmap. In other words, a map so that you have peace of mind, that you're working on a... What you want from a coach is you want a financial outcome. Forget about making a friend. You need to make financial freedom for yourself. That's what you want to talk about your coach. All right, so you got the idea. So coaches are important. I can give you an example of that. The one that comes to mind that is very easy is if you're a football fan, you'll jump right on this and know exactly what I'm talking about. So if you ever watch football, if you watch the playoffs even, you'll know in the past 10 or 15 years, there's one coach and one team who consistently, not every year, but consistent, continuously, they're in the playoffs or in the Super Bowl again and again, or if nothing else, they're in the thick of things at the as the football season winds down and they're getting into those final weeks before the Super Bowl. It's one team that's always there, and I think everybody will know what I'm already referring to. And the coach on that team is famous for taking average people and making a great team. And I'm talking about the New England Patriots. So am I a Patriots fan? No, I'm not a Patriots fan. But you have to admire what that coach has done. And he's done it consistently year in and year out. Now, you don't have to have a coach. You can do this on your own. Do you have enough life depth to get it done? Think about how long it's going to take you to do this. It's much easier to work with a coach, accelerate your learning, and get the job done. Now, the last example I'm going to give you is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods got a little bald head now. How come? Because he's been around a while. He's been all the way to the top, and he came crashing down. Unfortunately, he had a divorce. They claimed he was into drugs. Oh, he got a lot of bad press, a lot. But he decided he was going to come back. Then he hurt his back. So even while his back was hurting, he was taking coaching. He was having people help him. All I can say is, this year, he won the Masters. That's as good as you can get. So here's a guy that came back. He was 40 years old. For a golfer, that's not that's not particularly old, but it's not young either. Okay, now I'm running out of time, so I've got to get finished here so I can save some time. Bob Schumacher is coming up next, so I'm going to transition to that interview. Now, this guy's really paid his price. He started with me as a student more than 15 years ago, more than a decade anyway, and he took a business and a program that I taught him, and he expanded it. Now, he took what he learned in my lessons, and then he grew it, and he created an advanced level. Now, he could do that because he had experience in forestry, and he had understood land measurement and things like that. And now he's a coach, and he helps people evaluate large parcels of land, agricultural land, also forestry and things like that. My point is, I like to brag about I'm pretty good at doing deals in the urban areas. Bob is absolutely great doing it in rural areas. He's going to come on next and talk a little bit, but you want to get as much of Bob as you can when you're on my podcast, because this guy is really absolutely tremendous. So I joke a lot, and you'll hear me if you come to a three-day event. I joke with Bob at my workshop and tell everybody how thrifty he is. Folks, he's a cheapskate. He's a miser. But listen to this. His Roth IRA is so full of money that he could support not only himself for the rest of him and his family's life, but he could take a number of other families and support them too. He's made hundreds of thousands of dollars with tax lien certificates and tax defaulted property. Here's Bob. Hi, it's Linda. Four times a year, Ted Thomas invites students to a three-day auction preparation workshop. It's very exciting because Ted and the coaches tell all the students how to make big deals and little deals live in the room. Are you interested? Email info at tedthomas.com for more information. Back to the show. Well, hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and welcome to the podcast, and glad you're here. We're both fortunate, you and I, to have a special guest. His name is Bob Schumacher. He and I have been associated for, I always want to say 10 or 12 years, and he's probably going to say 20, but we've been associated a long time. And he started like many of us, including myself, I did well in life when I first started, and then I made a few mistakes, and I went through some very tough times, and Bob even had a few tough times in his life, but he's managed to uh, recover from all that, and now he's 
an expert at buying tax defaulted properties. And he's done auctions and been to auctions. And I think it's uh, 10 or 12, might maybe more states. And uh, we're fortunate to have him. So Bob, welcome to the call. Uh, glad to be here, Ted. Good. Now, I know that you've just come back from an auction and you took one of our auction classes there. So let's uh, concentrate uh, 15 or 20 minutes or however long you'd like to put in. Can you tell us what's entailed in that whole thing? Now, I know you have to do a lot of work in preparation, but tell us a little bit about the preparation you do first, but then tell us what happens. It's, for me, I, I think it's, it's like a transformation for the student who read about it, came to our class, and then shows up and it all happens. Maybe you could explain that, that they turn from, from a, a real person to a, an eager buyer before they're done. So maybe you have a story like that. Yeah, so typically we'll have maybe eight to 12 students. And one thing Ted does a good job of is he expects these students to be coaching students so that they have a little bit of training and background. And then we also expect all of them to do some homework before they get there. Because you can imagine if, if you, as one of the listeners, if you've never been to a tax sale before, just being thrown out there with two days of preparation and nothing else, it, it would be a really tough slog for you. It's just way too much to learn. And we have two webinars prior to the buying tour. And so each one of those is an hour long and Everybody is free to ask any question they want to related to the tax sales. And then I, I have my own research and the other coaches who do this, they do the same thing. Yeah. We go through the lists ourselves where the coaches do. And that way we can make an informed answer uh, when the students have a question. And so that's a really good preparation. Uh, we keep in contact by email, text message, whatever means prior to, to the tax sale and the buying tour. And so there are a lot of questions get answered beforehand. And by the time the people show up on the first morning, they have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And I can keep talking, Ted, if you wanted to. Yeah, that. please do. Okay. All right. So now I realized you paused there and I thought maybe you just took a breath. But so you are prepared before you you even tell us, okay, this is what we're going to do for this particular tour. And you prepare them before they come. Now, when they get there, what happens at that point? We start out, we have a, a hotel with a meeting room rented. And so the first morning and the second morning, we gather in that meeting room and we've got a projector and a slide screen there. And I, I just have the computer hooked up and you know, I show my list and we just scroll down property by property. And I give my take on those, those properties and the people give theirs. And keep in mind, we haven't seen them yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, we're, our discussion is based simply on the information we've gathered from getting the, the digital copy of the legal ad and going to the tax assessor's website and uh, pulling up the GIS map, uh, learning the uh, property address, assessed value, things like that. And so we can talk about what we know. And so quite a few of the properties, we look at, at just the information we have and say, this one is not worth looking at. And so we're trying to filter uh, properties out so that the ones that we actually go look at, we're not wasting our time on ones uh, that nobody is going to want to bid on. And so and that so, means you get, excuse me, that means you get rid of the junkers right away. You don't buy junk. Uh, absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah. The, uh, if you buy low end properties, by the time you pay all your holding costs and try to market, market it, chances are you're not going to make any money off of it. So, so this we, is, this is not that, that no down real estate kind of stuff, which is fine for certain markets, but this isn't that market. Yeah, th no, that, that is a totally different market. Yeah, yeah there's money to me be made there, but right. in right. this business, you do have holding costs and you have to keep that in mind before you bid. And if you buy the very low end stuff, it's really hard to make any money. And right. so that's, there's a lot of discussion about that 
over the course of the two days leading up to the tax sale. Now, so, let, me, let me interrupt if I can, because you know so much, and our podcast will have new people on it. So you mentioned you meet in this nice room, which I completely understand, and you start looking at these properties. And one of the things you mentioned is you look at a map, and I understand that. However, what would a GIS map be? What is that? Okay, yeah, for those of you that, that, uh, that are new to this, GIS stands for Geographic Informational, or Geographic Information System, GIS. Right. And so it's simply a digital version of a map. 20, 30 years ago, me and Ted, we had to look at paper maps. <laughs> and, and every once in a while, I still do. He is a good skill to have. But now you have all kinds of apps and you have the, most of the county websites have a GIS department someplace. And by pulling up a, an aerial view, and sometimes they have pictures taken from ground level as well. And that information is extremely valuable to you because you can make a lot of assessment about what's out there before you, you even get in the, the vehicle and go look at the property. So it could give you a, a, a real close up, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and one instance was that, and this was a point that I made in one of the webinars prior to the buying tour is that the eighth property on the list in one of the counties that we were researching is almost three acres mm -hmm. and it sat right on a paved road out in the country. But I took one look at it at the aerial view and with my forestry background, I said, that looks like a swamp. Whoa. And so made that point to everybody and I said, we're going to look at it anyway because there's another property on the list that has a mobile home on it that's uh, less than a quarter mile away. So it won't be any extra time to look at this, but I just want it to be a lesson. So let's look at it and see if I'm right. And we got out there and sure enough, it was right in a creek bottom and it's been raining a lot and it wasn't covered with water, but the soil was just mucky. Uh, Earlier, I think you said, maybe it was another podcast, you said something about me going out and getting my boots wet. But you yes. certainly got yeah. your boots wet on I that. want to get my boots wet on that one, right? Uh, so, so needless to say, everyone crossed that off their list immediately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Internet buyers beware. Because if, exactly. if you don't have someone look at that property, you made a big mistake. Because believe me, you'll be letting that go back to the tax sale a few years later and losing your money. Yeah, yeah. and in one of the other counties, there were... Actually, in both counties, we researched two counties. Good. And I'll make a point of that first. And then yeah, yeah, do that. That's good. Yeah, idea. I'll make that point is that on any given month in Georgia and also a lot of other states, there may be more than one county having auctions simultaneously. And so, as part of the preparation, uh, I have the students research two or more counties. And it turned out that this time around, the county to the north of us was having an auction. The county to the south of us was having an auction. Wow. Both of them had high quality lists. And so we didn't have to add any third or fourth counties. Uh, sometimes cool. we do. But at the end, when we get the final list the evening before the sale, then everybody gets to make up their mind which county that, that they go to. But oh. back to the point I was going to make was that Ted was mentioning letting it go back to another tax sale. In one county, there was one property that had been at, at a previous tax sale and the owner was letting it go. And then the county we ended up going to, Monroe County, there were two of them. And wow. one of those two was a driveway. Oh my God. So somebody bought a driveway at a tax sale and finally, I guess they realized what they had and they quit paying the taxes. Interestingly, someone bid on it at this tax sale. Now I'm guessing it, that it, the property led back uh, off of a county road into two houses. And I'm guessing that just one, one of the people that lived in those houses bought it just to, to have it in their name. Oh, to kind of clear the title. Uh, clear yeah, I, I didn't yeah. get a chance to talk to him, but that yeah. was my guess. I don't think it was right. somebody making a, a mistake that time around. I, yeah, think, yeah. I think it was somebody with a legitimate reason to buy it. Sure. All right. So we have a meeting. You go out and look at the properties. And when you're looking, I'm, I'm sure you're doing survey work and making sure that the, it is a complete lot, lot like you just mentioned. And you're probably uh, taking a look at if there's any structures and things like that. Anything else that you'd be doing out there? Sure. And if there's a structure, look to see if it's there still is a structure there. Because uh, very often, if there is a, a photo of, of 
the house or the mobile home on the assessor's website, sometimes those photos have a, a date stamp on them and some of them don't. Oh. But the d digital photography has been around long enough that a lot of the assessor's photos are 10 years old. Wow. So think about that. Think about what could happen to a house in 10 years. Right. And so right. a lot of those properties don't look anything like what the picture shows. So once again, that's buyer beware. And that's one of the things we cover in the buying tour is that, hey, you've got to lay eyes on it. And that's something that at every one of these tours, I get a remark from at least one of the students saying, wow, I didn't realize how important that was right. to go out and look at those properties. Right. Right. But it is super impo important. Yeah. So some of those, some of the houses are in better shape. Maybe that somebody's added on to them or fixed the roof or something. More often they're in worse shape or they're totally abandoned or a tree has fallen across them or they burned. Oh boy. But, but you got to, you have to lay eyes on those prop on, on, on those properties if you don't want to make a big mistake. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm back again, and I have a special guest this afternoon. I always say everyone's special, but you're really going to this uh, particular interview because Seth is someone that I've known for a while, uh, but let me tell you why I brought him on. As the event that we're doing on the air like this called a podcast is really unique in that you can bring different people on, and that's what, the reason I bring different people is I want you to get used to hearing other people and why they're successful. So this guy is really successful, and you're not going to believe this. He has nothing to do with real estate. He's never been a real estate guy, but when you hear the first part of his story, you're going to be shocked. Now, I want you to be shocked because I want you to listen and see how important marketing really is. So, Seth, what I want to do is say thank you for coming, first of all, and let me just tell a 30-second story that's going to lead you into a story that you're very proud of, and I'm proud of, too, because I love to hear it. And so, folks, Seth is a marketing guy. This guy's an award-winning marketing guy. Now, when I say that, I truly mean it. A large company in Chicago, it's an educational firm, has awarded him marketing guy of the year more than once. So this guy's terrific. And you're going to about to see why. Nothing to do with real estate. He's got to do with marketing. So Seth, I said to him one day, I said, Seth, have you ever sold anything with, with real estate and stuff like that? He said, yeah, Ted, I sold my house. I said, how could you do that with marketing? He said, I did it on Facebook. And now you're going to hear a story now that's completely unrehearsed, but this is a wonderful story. So Seth, tell them about selling your house using Facebook. I didn't believe it, but then I tried it. And you're not going to believe this one. I'll tell you the story right now. I got a check this morning. I got a check. I did a rent to own in Syracuse, New York, and I did it with the method that you taught me. This oh, wow. I didn't even know you had done it. Congratulations. That's yeah, so awesome. You. I did not know that had sale had closed. It just did this morning. At a, is, yeah. So, one of, so tell people what you do with your house and then let's talk about you. Sure. First of all, thanks for letting me be on your show. It's an honor to be here. You and I have known each other a long time. I greatly appreciate that you have, you're doing this show and you're educating people and you're sharing your wisdom, which you've got a lot of. So I didn't even know we were going to talk about that today, but it makes total sense why you would bring it up. So about five, six years ago, my wife and I had our third child was turning one and we had out, we had outgrown our starter house that we had bought when we first got married before we had kids. We now had three. Lily, our youngest was still in our bedroom. Her crib was still in our room and we were oh, bursting geez. at the seams. Uh, we said, all right, let's, we're going to sell the house. We're going to buy a bigger house and we're going to move neighborhoods. And I said, we, I live in Western New York. I live in Buffalo, suburbs of Buffalo. It is not a hot real estate market by any stretch of the minute. I'm not in Miami or Vegas or Air Phoenix or any of those good places. We're in the cold snow. So we're famous for losing sports teams and chicken wings and uh, snow. <laughs> so our houses aren't, it's not a hot real estate market. So I love it. I said, my wife said, she gets the credit for the idea. She said, we hired a realtor that I knew from my BNI networking group. And she started doing her thing and trying to schedule all these open houses where like you'd have four people show up and we'd have to take the kids and the pets out for two hours. And she'd be like, oh, we had four people, nobody bought. And my wife said, you own a marketing company. You're supposedly pretty good at this marketing stuff. It's paying for the next house. Do you think you could market our house? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, do some of that marketing beep you talk about and, and market our house. Yeah. And I said, so I went to my team the next day, I went to the office and I said, if we were going to market a house, if the house was the product, what would we do? Let's kick around some ideas. So we started masterminding together and we came up with something. We put up a Facebook fan page for the house. We posted a picture, a couple pictures of every room 
every single day. We ran Facebook ads to get fans for the house. We ran Facebook ads to get engagement, people liking or commenting or sharing the posts of every picture of every room in the house. And we built an audience of people who were married, who had two kids, because the house had three bedrooms, so mom and dad in one, two kids in another, which is where we ran out of space, because we were silly and had an extra kid. Um, so we ran uh, married couples, two kids who were little, because it has a, under the age of six, who were fans of like our school district, which was award-winning, but who didn't live there. Oh. So I figured if they were fans of the school district but lived nearby but not in it, they might want to move there. And they had two little kids who'd be perfect for the super duper elementary school we had. And I said, so I ran ads. And then what we did was after we had built an audience of people who were liking and sharing our posts, we then ran, we created a Facebook event, which was the open house. And I think we spent a couple hundred bucks in event response ads, getting people to sign up for the open house. And again, we made them sign up with email addresses and cell phone numbers. And so we could email them and text them and remind them and follow up with them. And then the, the event, the actual open house was literally standing room only. You couldn't, there was no room in the house, which was fantastic. And because all the people were clustered at this one day only, two hour only event, like the marketing for the, for, that we did on the event page said, we're going to sell the house in these two hours that's it. There's no other showings. It's going. And it came true. Like we had a bidding war, which again, not heard of much in Buffalo. And we got over asking and sold it in 24 hours. Oh, that's unbelievable. And, and my unbelievable. realtor said, what the heck did you do? I've never had more people at an open house in my life. And how many yeah. people actually showed up? I, I don't know. 20 something, whatever. It was over 30. I don't remember the exact well, number, but like literally it was a line out the door of people going in and coming out. Was that realtor happy or what? She was ecstatic because oh, yeah. she oh, wow. obviously captured right. everybody's information right. who came in on the sign-in sheet and then was able to go to them and say, I'm so sorry you couldn't get the house. It sold out in two hours, but I have other homes I'd like to show you. So mm -hmm. I'm sure she got more business out of it, but I did not negotiate a commission on her commission, okay. which I should have thought right. of. Oh, what a nice story. What a great story. All right. So I heard this story, everyone. I heard the same story. And so I said to my guy, who's a tech guy and understands uh, Facebook, and I don't. And he said, uh, I said, why don't we try and do what Seth just told us about? And so sure enough, he did it in all places of Canastoga, New York. I'm talking about 25 miles from Syracuse. It got so cold this year that Niagara Falls froze over. And here I am. I got a house on Facebook and people are calling me about it. And we just did a rent to own on that house. And honest to goodness, I got $7,000 more than my asking price. That's awesome. And I'm getting $1,500 a month for that house. So there's a great testimonial. So that leads us into this whole interview, which you and I have known each other a while. And I don't know that we always agree on everything. A lot of stuff that I don't even have a clue about. Listen, and I've forgotten more about real estate than I'm ever going to dream of knowing. Yeah. So we have this mutual admiration society. Yes. But tell people a little bit about your business because this is a unique, who knows, people might just call you up and say they want to do this and you could teach them how to do it. But the point is, tell people how important marketing is going to be to them when they get in business. Sure. So I am the founder and CEO of MarketDominationLLC.com. We're one of the fastest growing direct response marketing firms in the country, according to Inc. Magazine. I'll tell you what fast direct response means in just a minute. Ted's a direct response guy. We'll talk about that. And uh, I started out as just me and one client, and it's grown over the last 12 years. We've got an amazing, op we got a team of 33 people who work here. Wow. And we've, I've been in Inc., I've been in Forbes, I've been on NBC, CBS Money Watch. Entrepreneur Magazine has an article about to come out. And I'm the co-host of the Sharkpreneur podcast with Kevin from Shark Tank. So I've written seven best-selling books. It's been an absolutely incredible journey. Lots of ups and downs, lots of roller coaster. And marketing, that's what we do is we drive sales or leads for our clients, whether it's you, whether it's somebody in a, whether it's a doctor, lawyer, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, or whether it's somebody trying to sell their house. The one I did for my house was honestly the first real estate physical real estate campaign I've ever done. We do marketing for a lot of folks who teach real estate and we sell their courses and their products and their seminars. And we're now working on, as you mentioned, rent to own, lease to own, what we call marketing funnels based on the success of my house. And then you and I started talking again and you said, hey, could you do, could, would that work for us? And I said, yes, and you did it and it worked. So now we're gonna create a process to help other people do that. And why marketing is so important is if you're following what Ted teaches, if you're a student of Ted's, 
you're going to learn how to buy real estate like pennies on the dollar, literally pennies. And what are you going to do? You're going to follow Ted's system and you're going to buy low and sell low. You're going to be the Walmart of real estate and you're going to move properties super quick. No fix and flip, no getting your hands dirty, working five to 10 hours a week from your home, which is absolutely incredible. And I'm a student of Ted's, full disclosure. I'm going to my first auction in a couple months because I want to do the first one in person. And then once I do it and it works, I'm going to be hooked. And then I'm going to be buying all over the country, sitting at home on my laptop. There you go. And so once you've got this property, if you're buying, how are you going to sell it? You could engage a traditional realtor and sell it that way, sell it cheap, move it fast, which Ted teaches. Or, and you could possibly pull into the 21st century and do something like Ted and I just talked about and sell it either without the realtor and not have to pay the commission, or you could sell it with your realtor, but sell it for a heck of a lot more money like I've done and Ted just did. Let me just add a plus to this thing, okay? You didn't mention it, but everybody really needs to know what I spent was three hundred dollars oh, awesome. and i just did a rent to own now there wasn't a broker in the community that would have done it for less than ten thousand dollars and i couldn't find brokers because it was a rural property now it wasn't so it's rural the middle of nowhere miles, and it's but, free, you know, you're selling the wrong time of year and nobody and it wasn't it. the right school district and yep. we heard all the stories right and so now the rent to own i ended up the guy I, I, he just shocked me he said i'm a new police officer in your town and I look moving from another town and you get the best one in town and I saw it and I want to go look at it. Heck, we just gave him the key and every time something came up on it, he went and took care of it for us. He said, look, I want to buy this house. And so sure enough, we made a, a deal to rent to own it. So he's, he's going to buy, but $300. That's awesome. As a matter of fact, I'm playing a bigger commission in the office because Rand, <laughs> Lance, who works for me, he always makes fun of my shirts and everybody that knows me makes fun of my shirts. So Lance said, I don't want any of those, but I know that company makes t-shirts. And so he's a tech guy, a tech guy has to wear t-shirts, right? So he has, he's getting four t-shirts. He's getting a $400 commission. <laughs> His t-shirts are a hundred bucks. Oh now, my God, that's an expensive t-shirt. What the heck I is he mean, wearing? It's the designer, right? He has to get some fancy designs, so I'm not the only one with it. They're putting the t-shirt out of $20 yeah, yeah, bills? Yeah, yeah. So you, you got to get the idea. All right, so now let's give my audience some sense for being in business, because you're a businessman. If you grew a company, I think you grew that company in different states, right? Don't you have yes, we have offices in six states and three countries. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. Okay, I didn't realize all that. So you probably told me I'm an airhead, so it just went right out the other side. You're not. So, and so anyway, the, the point is, you know a lot about management. So let's talk a little bit about, these people are gonna go in, I get people that their average age is 45 to 105. And they work for somebody else and they've got money. Money is not usually a problem for them. They can afford to any courses, they can afford to buy these properties, but they don't know how to manage a little business. Now, I think the little business is probably gonna have one or two helpers at the most. Some get big like you, 30, 33 people, it's a lot. So give us some insight to, to its business and hiring and firing and some of the challenges. Wow, okay, so we could do probably a couple days just oh, on yeah, that. Yeah. So. Hiring and firing. So we do, so one of the lessons I've learned about, so our mutual mentor and friend, Dan Kennedy says, fire fast, hire slow. Yes. And that you should always be interviewing and always be recruiting because you don't want to have to hire when you're in a bind. You want to have a stable of qualified candidates that you want to hire ready to go for when you have a project that you need them for. I've made more mistakes than I'd care to remember in the hiring and firing process. One of the things we've learned for us is we will disqualify people in our ads. So when we write an ad recruiting for a position, we will say, don't apply for this if you're blah, 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 blah. We will specifically tell people, hey, if you're lazy, if you want to sit at home in your underwear and not work, oh if, boy, if you're a millennial, if you got no work ethic, if you can't handle pressure or deadlines, stuff like that. Say, if you're a millennial, a millennial you I stopped myself because one of my yeah, best employees good. is a millennial, but yeah, she's yeah. the only one I found with yeah. a work with an amazing work ethic. Yeah. So we disqualify in our ads and purposely try and repel the wrong people so they don't bother applying. It doesn't always work. There's still people who apply anyway, and then we try and reject them in a phone interview. One of the best lines I learned, techniques I learned, was from a book called Top Grading on how to hire top performers. And one of the lines in the phone interview before you even get them in person is we're really looking for A players. And I just not hearing that from you, but thanks anyway. And if they say, okay, bummer, sorry, and hang up, that's it, it's over. Cause they didn't fight for it. 
But if you say, I'm just not hearing A plus per A performer from you, and they fight you on it and argue and try and prove why they are, that earns them an interview because they actually had some ambition. So you're saying people have to have some ego to get a job with you. Heck yeah. I, so what be we wrong. Yes. Because they got to talk I, back. Yes, they absolutely have to have a spine and some chutzpah, as our Jewish friends would say. So yeah. they have to, we hire for personality. Because everything, every marketing skill I've acquired, I learned. I either was taught by someone, bought a course, like a course from you and learned a skill, right. or I figured it out. So it's all learned. I wasn't born with any of it. Right. And every employee we've had and still have, we teach mostly how to do what we do. So anyone can learn all of the aspects of marketing. If I can learn it, they can learn it. Anybody can learn it. It's the personality that matters. It's the, do you fit in with our culture? Am I going to like hanging out with you eight hours a day? Do I want you to become a part of our family? For example, we adopted a puppy. We got a puppy like six, seven months ago. And we posted, my wife posted a picture on Facebook. And one of my top team members said, oh, Auntie Kristen loves him already. Like she's a member of the family. Like she's watched our kids grow up. She's been here since before a couple of my kids were born. I would trust them to watch my kids. Like they have to be, it's personality matters more because skill is learnable. What you just said is they don't have to go to college and have a six year degree or a four year degree or any of those things. They need to have the skill to learn. Yeah. Some of our best team members are stay at home moms who either don't have a college degree or they've been out of the workforce for 12, 15 years raising kids. Yeah. They want to get back to work part time. They're worried they don't have the qualifications because they've been out of the workforce for a dozen years. And it, my, my wife is like PTA president. She's Girl Scout president. And she does a million other things. And I say, she could run any Fortune 500 company, juggling all the balls in the air she's got every day of getting everywhere, everyone to the right places at the right times and managing all of the people at the school and Girl Scouts. I said, you could run my company. Your job is har harder than my job. I would hire any stay-at-home mom. So she said, well, you should. So we put up a recruiting ad saying, hey, stay-at-home moms, come work for us. And it worked. Oh, I like to hear that. That's great. And how do they like that? Do they have to be on the payroll or are they independent contractors? We have both. So we have moms who are on payroll, who are physical in our offices. Oh, yeah. um, and then we have moms who work remote part-time, a couple hours a week or more, depending on whatever fits in their schedule. And they love the fact that as a dad of three little kids, I get it. So when they say, my kid's sick, I got to go to the doctor, or I, we got a soccer game, or something came up, I'm used to it because it's my life. Okay. So what does this little real estate entrepreneur do about getting help? Just give us some insight because you've had the, you've had both sides. You've hired people. Yeah, they didn't work out. Then you hired some, they became superstars, I'm sure. So it works both ways. I don't know if it's 80, 20 or what it is, but it's probably, uh, it's probably a struggle. So they're going to have to go through a few people maybe, right? Yeah. We've fired more people than we've kept. We've had, I, I could tell you horror stories of employees calling from jail, of Oh my goodness. So problem I'm, stealing, I've been buying, that. Okay, I want to miss that part. A whole bunch of stuff. Yes, you'd like to avoid all of that. So I would say I would start small. I would start with someone working virtual a few hours as you get used to figuring out what your processes are and what you can use them for. A friend of mine, Nathan Hirsch, runs our favorite source for virtual employees, which is called freeup.com because oh. it frees up your time. You can get people all over the world, whether you want to start somebody really cheap at five bucks an hour in the Philippines, or whether you want somebody in the US who's working 20 bucks an hour, right. they run the gamut depending on what skill sets you need. They can do all the kinds of research. They can research properties for you. You could have them analyzing the numbers on every single property at the auction that you were going to have them go look at and prepare a presentation for you on which ones look like a good idea. You could have them emailing homeowners. You could have them doing whatever you want. See, that's what these people need to do. They need to make con contact. So let's talk a little bit about that from your marketing experience. So the guy has a house to sell or the gal, by the way, 60% of my clients are women. So they kind of tune in and they do that repetitious work, whereas guys, oh, they don't, they're not so repetitious. But anyway, they'll, the women will stay on onto it. So give us some insight uh, of what you've other, seen other people do with regard to marketing a property, for example. Sure. So if you're marketing a property, we would start with who, figuring, helping you figure out who's the ideal buyer for that house. Like for my first house, the ideal buyer was a young family with two kids under the age of six. And we were able to target them in Facebook. Maybe they're in a retirement community and you want, you're in Florida and if you had property there, perhaps an out-of-state buyer, someone from Buffalo who wants to be a snowbird and come live in Florida six months out of the year and get away from the snow 
would be the perfect buyer. <laughs> and, and I guarantee you away from snow. Much and I guarantee snow. you there are not too many Florida real estate property investors who are busy marketing their houses to Buffalo and Syracuse, but they should be. Uh huh. Okay. So it all, all starts right. with who's the ideal buyer for your property and then trying to capture their attention in a way that's unique and different and will get them to want to learn more about what you've got. Okay. Broadly paint a picture for their new real estate investor on what they need to be thinking about. Give them a one, two, three, if you can, about what they should be thinking about. I tell them, so that you think about the exit strategy. Don't think about buying it. Think of who you're going to sell it to and how. But do you think they do that? They don't do that. Oh, I got this great deal, Ted. Okay. Who are you going to sell it to? Oh, I'm going to hire a realtor. And I can assure you, I just did it in Syracuse. And I did nine last year. And in Syracuse, I was scratching my head. And I got to be careful because I haven't got much hair left. So I, <laughs> I got to be very careful. I'm scratching my head trying to sell this property. And I just use the techniques you taught of. So before you do anything, don't let me forget. And I'm going to do it right now. Tell people how they can make contact with you. Sure. MarketDominationLLC.com is our main website. If you go there, you can grab it. You can fill out a form, you name, email, phone number, whatever, and it'll take you right to my calendar and you can book a time to talk to us. And I'm happy to talk to anyone from your audience. Okay, good. All right. So give me the company name slowly now because my people- Market, MarketDominationLLC.com. The reason I have to do that is because they're all in a car right now. We're doing a podcast. If they're sitting at the desk- Be careful when you're driving. Yeah, be careful when you're driving. Okay, so that's all good stuff. Tell me what else you'd like us to know about you, and then I'll put you on the hot seat with a couple of other questions. Sure. Let's see. I am a passionate, involved dad in my kids' lives. My 12-year-old son is a soccer star, so I wow. coached him for eight years, and now he moved up to a more competitive- You coached him? So yes. You were a player? Yes, I, I played and coached before I had a marketing career. Good for you. Uh, but he is, a, he is better than I ever was. I coached him for eight years and, and then he moved up to a more competitive league that doesn't allow volunteer dads anymore. They have like professional, like real soccer coaches, like division one guy, like superstar coaches, cost a lot more money, but working with him. So I, I met every, take him to every practice, go to every game as long as I'm in town. So I'm very involved with that. My daughter, Ella, is a 10-year-old right now. She's an actress. And that's what I originally went to college for. So right. I've been working with her on every play rehearsal and helping her with every line and every dance step and every song. And You're a true dad. You're really I being, am. You're doing the whole dad thing. You can, I I'm going to write a book on how to be a dad. I can see it now. Wow. I've written, I, I got seven business books. I haven't gotten around to a dad book yet. That's oh, not yeah. a bad idea though. Yeah. My, yeah. my wife has a mom book coming out soon. So hers will probably be better than mine. Oh my goodness. Um, oh. She's one of the top hundred mommy bloggers in the country at whinypalooza.com. But I, and then our youngest is a uh, dancer and a gymnast, which are not my areas of expertise. So that's all mom. Wow. And so how'd you get interested in this marketing stuff? You went from acting to, this is a heck of a transition over these unhealthy marketers that we know <laughs> that spend half their nights and where well, they should be going home in the bar brooding over what they didn't sell today. So okay. That's not me, but yeah. the transition was I switched from acting to becoming a college financial planner because oh, really? every semester my dad told me I had to come home from Syracuse where I went to college Good. and, and co come live at home because he couldn't afford college. And it drove me crazy. So by the time I graduated, I wanted to help other people avoid that problem. I became a college financial planner and I was making 300 cold calls a day, interrupting strangers asking for money. 300? 300. 50 minute blocks, 50 calls, 10 minute break, 50 more. Uh, and I did that for a number of years because my branch manager said to do that. And I didn't know any better until I found our mutual friend, Dan Kennedy, who I learned direct response marketing from. And that took me to the top 30 financial advisors nationwide for opening new accounts. And wow. then that got a lot of press. That was all pre-internet. That was all direct mail, which you'll appreciate. And then that launched it. My phone started ringing of advisors who wanted to be me. So that launched Market Domination, LLC.com 12 years ago, where we started off serving one financial advisor. And we've since grown to 2,000 some odd clients worldwide over the last 12 years. How nice is that? And your company name is? MarketDominationLLC.com. Okay, I want to get that in there because nobody that I know of, you gave me all this free information. And you said, Ted, here's what I did to sell my house. I was astonished when you said that. I said, I'm going to just go find out for myself. And I didn't even know how to find out for myself. I just said to my guy, Lance, can you do this? He said, yeah. Then he came to me and said, I'm going to have to spend $80. I said, you're going to say, how much? He said, $80, is that okay? <laughs> oh, please, $80. And a broker's going to cost me 10 grand. That was very difficult 
for me to make tough that decision. decision. Yes. Oh my God, really tough. Anyway, this is a wonderful interview. We're going to run out of time. Give us some insight on how to handle problems in a business from your perspective and maybe how to avoid them if you can. You're never going to avoid problems. Problems is where you grow on the other side of your breakdowns or your breakthroughs. And I would say that the level of problems you have match the level of success you've got. So when you're just starting out, you have small problems and a small business. The bigger the business gets, the bigger the problems are. And most, if you can find a way, as Napoleon Hill says, to turn every adversity into the seed of a greater benefit, if you can look at the problem as an opportunity for growth and say, how do I make it so that this issue doesn't come up again? That's the blessing. That's the silver lining. And what we've done is tr I've tried, and I'm getting better, I've tried to see solve the problem and then turn that solution into a product for somebody else or a service that we could offer. Wow. So for example, we had the problem of how to, our, our house isn't selling. What do we do to fix it? Created a solution. And then magically, it could be a service for other people. Or I had a problem when I first launched my first podcast. How do I make the money at, how do I make money at this? How do I make this thing grow? I figured it out. And since then, we've gone on to have 80 different clients hire us to produce their shows because we knew what we figured out what to do. Wow. Wow. Seth, this has been a terrific interview. Your head is full of wisdom that you're so willing to share with people. And I admire what you've done. And I'm very respectful. And I honor what you've done. So thank you again. And say your website again slowly or your con contact information so everybody gets it because you're a fast-talking New Yorker. This is very true. So again, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun to, to banter with you and share with your audience. Seth Green, marketdominationllc.com. Great stuff.